If you recall, our time together is studying in the book of Colossians. And a few weeks ago, if you can recount, we studied the preeminence of Christ. Christ is supreme. And that is how Paul chose to open his epistle to these believers. But since these believers do not know Paul individually, Paul seems in this next section before us this morning to give himself a biographical sketch, to give us a picture into the life of the apostle and what his work is as an apostle on their behalf. But before we hear from the word of God and the life of Paul and his ministry, let us pray. O oh, Father, we pray that you reveal the, the mystery to us this morning, that you apply the mystery to our hearts, and that mystery being Christ. Lord, reveal Christ to us in the clarity and simplicity of your word. In your name, amen. Hear now from the book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the, body of, uh, for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we might present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, and he powerfully works within me. Here ends our New Testament lesson, and this is the word of God. God. Have you ever watched or heard a great mystery? Have you ever watched or heard a great mystery? There is a part of us that loves to solve the unknown. If you've read a great mystery novel, uh, every page forces you to read the next page because you just want to watch a little more, a little more. If you enjoy any popular streaming services, they always want you to binge by leaving you with a cliffhanger so that you just watch another episode. As a child, I often uh, tuned in to a show with a mystery gang that solved mysteries with their dog. And I always got it wrong. I always prematurely chose the villain, and I was wrong. But by the end of the episode, I would see who the villain was, and the mystery would be revealed. But after the mystery is revealed, often there is no point to read or watch again. I know who did it. It was the butler. Or I, I've read it, and this is the murderer all along. And so what happens with the mysteries that we often enjoy? We never enjoy them again. We put them on the shelf. Go to your local bargain bookstore, riddled with mysteries. And as they are riddled with mysteries, you can pick one up for just a dollar or two. We are fascinated with mysteries. Well, there is a mystery of God in this text before us today. Is it like the mysteries that we enjoy in this world? Maybe. But I think there is an even a greater sense of mystery as Paul uses this term. For this mystery is not a mystery at one time you will enjoy and shelve for the rest of your life but it's a mystery that keeps you turning page by page for the rest of your life as you learn more and more about your God. Paul gives us a sense of this mystery. What is the mystery? How is this mystery in this text revealed to us today? 
Is it like a novel or a story that we read and the more we read, the more we investigate, it is exposed? No, by no means. The mystery that Paul has for us in this text before us this morning is a mystery that is revealed not by our own work, but by his spirit. Therefore, in our world today, this mystery remains a mystery for many. For it is only by the work of our Holy Spirit, by His Holy Spirit, that we come to know this mystery. This morning, we're not going to only focus on the mystery itself, but what the mystery has done in the life of the Apostle. What does this mystery do to Paul, a man that once killed and persecuted the church, a man that once sought to destroy the church, is now the one who is an apostle in the church and seeks to build it. This mystery has changed Paul. The revelation of the mystery that we see before us this morning is a mystery that changes us. And as it changes us, it changes everything. It changes everything. For the Christian, for Paul, who often suffers, suffering becomes worth it. The revealed mystery of Christ changes everything. The revealed mystery of Christ changes everything. How does it change everything? First, The mystery causes the Christian to suffer. What does the revealed mystery do for the believer? It causes them to suffer. Look down at verse 24 with me. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, that which is given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known. Paul suffers on behalf of the mystery. Uh, As the mystery is revealed in Acts chapter 25 to Paul on the road to Damascus, he is blinded and he is saved. And in that salvation, in that revelation, he becomes an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that apostleship, he suffers. The gospel causes Paul to suffer. And notice Paul's response to that suffering. The old man in us would often say, Oh, the pity on me. Oh, woe is me for what I have experienced. Woe is me. Why do I have to go through this suffering? We complain and we blame God. But notice Paul's response to the suffering. Now I rejoice in my suffering. The revealed mystery of God not only uh, causes the Christian to suffer, but it, it enables them to endure through that suffering. Paul can only write this if the Holy Spirit is working within him, sustaining him, equipping him, and being with him. The Spirit uplifts Paul and allows him to suffer. But Paul, what does his mind go to in his suffering? Does it go to his own worldly ends? No. But you see in verse 24, it continues uh, uh, that, that Paul goes to Christ. In my suffering, in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of the body. What is Paul saying? Is Paul saying that uh, you need me in order to be saved? That Christ's suffering and death on the cross wasn't enough and that now I have to suffer in order for you to be saved? No. If you remember the the sermon a few weeks ago, it is that Christ is supreme, supreme. He is superior. He is above all. What Paul is saying for us today is as, uh, as he identifies with the sufferings of Christ, it is he seeing himself as, as, as going out into the world and fulfilling the call of God in his life. 
He realizes that the work of Paul, uh, the work of Christ, is leading forward to the gospel to be known to all. If you remember, Christ's ministry was in Jerusalem. It was in Capernaum. It was in Jewish regions. But if you remember in Isaiah, uh, uh, what Isaiah says is the gospel, the word, will go forth to all the nations. And so what Paul is identifying here is he is identifying as a suffering servant for Christ, going out, bringing Christ to the nations as Christ has been promised. And he identifies with the suffering servant, with Christ. Second Corinthians says, for just as we share abundantly in the suffering of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. Paul is not alone in his suffering. The Christian life is full of suffering. The Christian life is full of suffering. You might be tempted to put suffering in a box. Well, suffering must be a, a physical oppression in this world. Uh, suffering must be being ostracized in the public square for your faith. We often have such a narrow view of suffering that it seems that we never really suffer. But I'm reminded of a story from one of my professors at RTS. Uh, as a non-believer, he came to faith in his mid-20s, and as he came to faith, he loved classical music, loved it. And as his father died, he left him a massive collection of classical works that he can listen to all day, and all night. And as he became a Christian and, and campus outreach in England, uh, his pastor uh, uh, encouraged him, what are you struggling with? What are your idols? And he said, certainly classical music. I listen to it every waking moment. I love it dearly. And the pastor encouraged him to throw it all away. And you might think at first, why? That is insane. A collection of great classical work all on record to be played. But he saw the importance for his devotion to suffer by giving up. Is it the right? Do you have to give up your classical music? No. But the point is that as we are Christians, we suffer in ways you probably don't even realize. We're often thinking that suffering is out there, out in the Middle East, in China. But at the very least, for the Christian here today, we ought to suffer internally. For our spirit in Christ wages a war against the sin of our flesh. Think of it like this. Before you were a Christian, you struggled with many trials and tribulations. You got sick. You lost your job. You struggled with addiction. After becoming a Christian, you may still have all those things. You may still struggle with addiction. It, you may still become sick, and you will become sick. You may still lose your job. But in addition to those sufferings that the natural man always has, as a Christian, you take on a new set of sufferings. If you recall, uh, you once lied flippantly. Who cares about lying? And now when you lie, your soul is grieved because of the lie you told. A little lust no big deal. But after you become a Christian, that lust torments your soul. You suffer. You were once friends with people you chose. You become a Christian, and now you have all these friends you do not choose. That's sometimes hard. Sometimes hard. Think of it. 
Before becoming a Christian, your boss told you to cut corners and you delighted to save the company money. And now, as a Christian, your boss tells you to cut those same corners and you have to hand in your resignation, your family, not knowing where your next paycheck will be. Suffering. The Christian suffers, but we, that's the, that might be the narrow scope. We have to remember the world at large as well. That the church will suffer as the body of Christ in this world. The church of Iran, the church in the Middle East, the church in China suffers in a very real sense that we do not know. And we ought, as the people of God, to lift up prayers regularly for those who are in countries of persecution. And even as we lift up prayers for them, we ought to be reminded and not be so prideful and arrogant to think that that very suffering that is experienced so far away can't come to our own homes, to our own backyards. We might enjoy, and we do enjoy, freedom to gather, but that freedom isn't guaranteed. And if Christ takes it we will suffer. So what does this mystery do? It changes everything. First, it causes you to suffer and to endure that suffering. But second, if you look down at the text at verse 26, the mystery gives you hope of glory. It's not all downcast. The mystery gives you hope of glory. Verse 26, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make them known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of his glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We've already discussed what is this mystery. I was often, as a young Bible student, wondering what mystical sense uh, of this word, what is mystery? What is the great uh, secretive mystery that God reveals? Well, Paul tells us quite plainly in verse 27, it is Christ in you. It is the hope of glory that you have in your Savior. That is the mystery. That is the mystery. And it is not cognitive. The mystery being revealed isn't uh, on Scott's own uh, 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 mental uh, capacities. But it is a revelation of the Holy Spirit. Think of it back in the Old Testament, the mystery that we read about in Daniel. Uh, The mystery in the Old Testament was before the incarnation of Christ, and it was revealed. The truth of God was concealed, and even in the mystery, uh, even in the New Testament, as Christ comes, what does he often say? He says, go and tell no one. Uh, he, he, He is still in the life of concealment. There is a concealed aspect in both the Old and in the Gospel of Jesus Christ that there is a concealed mystery. Tell them parables because they will not believe and understand. You are healed. Tell no one. The age of concealment is over. As Paul is commissioned and going out, taking the great commission of Matthew 28, preaching and discipling and baptizing all those who come to faith. And it is exposed. What was once a shadow is now real. That Old Testament sacrifice is now pointed forward to the Christ. That great prophet Moses is now seen in its true light in the person of Jesus Christ, the greatest prophet. Uh, The King David, the greatest king of Israel, is now seen in greater glory in the kingship of Christ on the earth. He is revealed and there is hope by his Holy Spirit. Notice the scope of this revelation. Is it contained to Israel? No. It's not at all. Verse 27, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of this glory. The mystery revealed in Israel spreads and goes out to the world by the preaching of the word, by receiving the word, by prayer through the sacraments, Christ is revealed. Christ is revealed. This week, 
I'll begin teaching a Sunday school on John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. And to prepare for this time, I chose to read a biography of John Bunyan. And he had a life of suffering. It might be a topic of this sermon. He had a life of suffering. But what I want you to note in the life of John Bunyan is the hope of glory that he had. I remember as I was reading through that book that uh, he was charged to quit preaching. If you quit preaching, you can be a free man and go home to your family. But if you continue to preach, we will prosecute you and you will spend the rest of your days in prison. A one exchange that I found most uh, 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 impacting uh, myself was when Bunyan, during one of these exchanges, stop preaching and be free. This is what Bunyan says. If I were out of prison today, I would preach the gospel again tomorrow. See, then he was left to rot in that jail cell, filthy jail cell. What could cause Bunyan to persevere in the midst of such trial and tribulation? It is the hope of glory in Christ. It is he knew Christ was with him. And in that knowledge of knowing Christ was with him as revealed by Christ's Holy Spirit, he perseveres, spends 12 years in prison, and then he is in and out of prison for the rest of his life. And it is because of that suffering in prison we have the Pilgrim's Progress. In the midst of trials and tribulations, it is easy for us to become downcast. But will you look with me to the Holy Spirit as he is your comforter, as he is your renewer, as he is the one with you in your suffering and reminds you of Christ and his suffering. The great hope goes beyond our own life, but in the kingdom of Christ. The revealed mystery changes everything. I hope you can see that. It, it changes everything. First, we saw that the revealed mystery, it causes you to suffer, but Christ gives you the power to endure. Second, we see that the mystery gives you hope. But finally, we see that the Christian matures by this mystery. Verse 28. Look at it with me. Him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we might present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, and he powerfully works within me. The wisdom uh, that is obtained by the preaching of the word that Paul himself uh, 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 receives uh, is for maturity. We often uh, connect maturity with just personal discipline. But what Paul is trying to reveal to us today is how do we mature? It is by the mystery. It is by the gospel. It is by Christ. It is by, as Randy loves to say so often, the ordinary means of grace. We grow regularly and continually through the preached word, through prayer, and by receiving the sacraments. That's how we grow. That is the most ordinary way to grow. And that is the point of the mystery. How do we become more like Christ? How do we become mature? It is through his Word. I love the word for maturity here. It's not, a, it has a stronger sense than what we often give to maturity. It is a progression. It is a, 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 a very sanctified, fortified maturity. If you take this word at its most literal sense, maturity is perfection. It is becoming perfectly mature. And that is the Christian life. It is the progress. It is the direction of the life. The more and more as you live under and disciplined under the preached word of God, the more you sit under it, the more you are matured, the closer you get to that fortified maturity. 
And as Christ returns, that fortified maturity turns into perfect maturity. As Christ returns or as you pass on and die and you join Christ, you are perfectly made mature. This word points forward. The Christian matures in the mystery. You being reborn into Jesus Christ is not the only thing the apostle cared about. We, and Christian ministers, have often been guilty of this, especially in our own day and age. We just care about conversions. We are so focused on just giving a message that will convert that we forget about maturity. We've, I've heard it before saying, oh, well, uh, you're at that Presbyterian church. We send the people that want to learn about God to you. We're just here in the business of converting. But what we see with the Apostle Paul is that it, there, there need not be a dichotomy. We are called to preach the gospel and to seek, to equip and, and prepare the saints for a life in Christ, for maturity. And dare I say it with the topic of suffering, that God uses our suffering for his glory and our maturity. God uses our suffering for his glory and our maturity. That's a hard pill to swallow in our own day and age. God uses your suffering, the things that you constantly experience, any of your suffering, for your own maturity. Think of the life of Paul. This man was beaten, bruised, stoned, shipwrecked, starving, thirsty, uh, dying. And what does he say? To, if I am absent from the body, I am present with the Lord. Paul, like the best of us, could have said, why have you done this to me, God? But instead, he counts everything a loss, even his suffering, for the sake of of Christ. Can God create good out of suffering? Yes, and he does. I come from a broken home, from a young child. My parents divorced, a messy divorce, very messy. And I often wondered why, God? Why do I suffer this way? Why? And what I've come to realize is that God used that suffering, that estrangement from parents, that separation from father to bring me to his church. My parents were divorced my sixth grade year of middle school, and by the winter, I was at a church. Never religious, but God used and not only did God use that suffering of divorce in my own life, but the experience that I have received has been a blessing to many others. For we all know people that have suffered with divorce. We know children that suffer through it. We know adults, adults that still struggle through the separation of their parents. And what has my suffering enabled me to do? To give perspective for those who will suffer like me. God uses our suffering. You might say, well, how does he use my particular suffering? I don't know. I can't give you the details. It's part of a mystery. But what I do know is that even in the midst of your greatest trials, whether they are caused for the sake of the church or not, God uses it for his glory and even your good. The revealed mystery of Christ changes everything. It causes you to endure suffering. It guides you to a revealed hope and glory, and it leads you to Christian maturity. But Paul doesn't write all of this in vain, for we have a Savior that is the great revealer. 
We have a Christ that is with us and does not expect us to suffer for his name's sake in vain. But he knows, as 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians tell us, uh, that he is one that suffers all the things that we suffer. He identifies with us to the point that our suffering, and as we identify with him, he identifies with us. He is with us, around us, and he is our redeemer. He is the redeemer that gives you the power to endure suffering. He gives you the power to look forward to the future hope that is in Jesus Christ. And he gives you the power to mature along the way. Join me in calling upon the Spirit to endure and enjoy the mystery that we now know. This is not a bargain book mystery, but it is a mystery that for the rest of our lives, we desire to know the next page. We desire to know God further and fuller. We desire to know Christ all the more. We as his people gathered to proclaim God as the Savior, seek to know God forevermore. Let us close in prayer. Lord, our help is in your name. And we pray for those even in our midst that have not been exposed to your revealed mystery, that you would soften their hearts to receive this mystery revealed. Humble us, O Lord, to realize that this mystery of revelation is not just my own understanding, our own understanding, but it is an understanding granted by Christ, chosen by the Father, given by the Spirit. And we pray that our hearts, souls, and minds come to a knowledge of that truth. We pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.